A Louisville, Kentucky domestic violence call would bring an ill-fated relationship to an end. The body buried in the wine cellar would answer the question of where a missing man had gone. The resulting murder trial is still talked about to this day. Thank you for joining me for Graveyard Love, the murder of Jamie Carroll. On June 17, 2010, 38-year-old Jeffrey Munt placed an urgent call to 911. He said Joseph Banus, his boyfriend, was trying to kill him with a knife. When the police arrived, they assumed the enormous house was a set of apartments and not a single dwelling, so it took them a while to find Munt. When they finally did enter the house, they found Jeffrey Munt locked in a bathroom. Around this same time, the police caught and arrested his boyfriend, Joseph, or Joey Banus, as he tried to flee the scene. In the patrol car, on the way to the police station, Joey Banus told the officers there was a body buried in the basement of Jeffrey Munt's home. The police didn't believe Banus at first, thinking he was trying to get out of his domestic violence arrest. When he offered the name of the dead man, police began to pay attention. Searching for the victim, John, or Jamie Carroll, police found two things. He had outstanding warrants, and he hadn't been heard from in months. What had started as a domestic violence call was turned over to the Homicide Division. In custody, Joey Banus told the police he, Munt, and Carroll were having a threesome high on meth that Carroll had provided. When they ran out of drugs, Carroll left the house to get more. While he was gone, Banus says Jeffrey Munt floated the idea that they should kill Carroll for his drugs and money. Banus says when Carroll got back, they resumed their threesome, but at some stage, he, Banus, took a break. Watching porn, Banus says before he knew what was happening, there was blood flying everywhere. He says he was in shock, sort of frozen in place, when he heard Munt barking commands, ordering him to help him take the body of Mr. Carroll down to the basement. The police asked who dug the hole. Banus responded that Munt threatened to kill him if he didn't help hide the body. One of the detectives said he didn't believe Banus at first. Due in part to Banus's extensive criminal history, Banus had eight felony charges and had served time in prison. Another officer said he didn't believe Banus because, in his words, he was all tatted up and he had a mohawk. This disbelief soon fell away when Banus provided the police with a map of where to find the body of Jamie and Carroll, buried in the old wine cellar, now used as a basement. Carroll had been buried in the basement for seven months. After extensive digging in the area indicated by Banus, police excavated a 50-foot Rubbermaid container. They took the container to the medical examiner's office, where it was opened. The medical examiner determined that Carroll had been shot in the face and neck. He had suffered multiple stab wounds. Three of the stab wounds were fatal. Banus also provided the police with the phone number and email address of Carol's mother so she could be notified of his death. Jeffrey, or Jeff Munt, reacted to the news of the body in his basement with shock and disbelief. He told the police he had no idea Carol was there. To get a better picture of the dynamics of the police investigation, which was rapidly turning into a he said, he said situation, it might be helpful to have a picture of the suspects as they sat in police custody. Joey Banus came from a wealthy family. His father was a prominent plastic surgeon, but he also had a long history of drug abuse. He also was a convicted felon. Jeff Munt, on the other hand, seemed like a Boy Scout by comparison. He was the owner of a home in the historic section of Louisville, Kentucky. He had a high-paying job in IT, and he had never been arrested. Banus's criminal past and drug addiction seemed to convince the police that he was the perpetrator and Munt the coercively controlled victim. I'll just add here that of the two, Joey Banus was the more masculine presenting of the couple, and Jeff Munt seemed at least to the police to be the more passive one. All of these things added, no doubt, to the police assessment of who was the main actor, but perceptions would soon change. When the police talked to Munt and referred to Banus as his boyfriend, Munt told them that Banus was no longer his boyfriend, adding that he would do everything he could to help bring Banus to justice.
Now the police had a full head of steam that it was Banus who was the killer, and they went back in to confront him. Even under pressure, Banus repeated the same story, though this time he added that in the struggle, Munt pulled out a gun and shot Carroll. When police asked Banus about Jamie Carroll, Banus said as far as he knew, no one suspected Carroll was missing because he was supposed to have turned himself in on a warrant. When the police checked, they found again that Banus was telling the truth. The police were beginning to suspect that Jeff Munt knew more than he had confessed to. Police got Munt to agree to take a polygraph test. Before the test, they re-emphasized the fact that if he lied at all during the test, he would fail. Munt reasserted his innocence. Then, just before the lie detector test, Munt suddenly made an admission. He told the police, well, yes, I did know about the murder. The police were completely shocked. There is an episode of this case on the first 48. And when I say to you that the police were shocked, I'll leave the link to the program below. It, It looks like something out of a Hollywood movie. They are utterly taken aback. So they go back in. They stop the lie detector test. They take Munt into an interrogation room where he asks them, do you want to know the true story? Munt began his version of events by saying, Joey invited this guy over. I don't remember his name. The guy was a drug dealer. Munt tells the police the same story as Banus, except the positions are switched. In his story, it's Banus and Carol on the bed. Banus who cuts Carol's throat, and Banus who grabs the gun. As Munt says, Joey shot the guy. He says Banus points the gun at him and orders him to help dispose of Carol, or he'd kill him. 37-year-old James, or Jamie Carroll, was born in eastern Kentucky in the Low Country, and his family was utterly devastated by his loss. Soon after he graduated from high school, Carroll opened a beauty salon. His mother said he was fascinated by the bright lights of the big city, so he moved to the city of Louisville in Kentucky, where he began doing drag shows and crystal meth, which led him to start to deal the drug as well. A friend said, problems seemed to dog Carol. He was a sweet, sweet man, but the drug thing really sent him down a dark path. Growing up gay wasn't easy for him, and his family life was apparently full of physical abuse. Carol started a fairly successful career in drag. His drag character was Ronica Reed, the pageant queen. Carol fashioned his character around the real Ronica Reed's turn as a high school pageant queen. Ms. Reed apparently loved it, by the way. It seems that Carol struggled financially with life in the city, which led to drug dealing. Addiction is a complicated thing, and without his own thoughts, it's impossible to know his motivations. What we do know is that Carol and Banus had known one another. Banus told police he had met Jamie through crystal meth connections on Adam for Adam, under the username Cruising Not Using. When Carol's mother stopped hearing from him, she assumed that Jamie was in jail. Mund and Banus were both arrested and charged with murder, robbery, and tampering with physical evidence. They both faced the death penalty. Before we get to Banus's trial, there's something you should know about the couple. Munt and Banus met on a dating site, Adam for Adam, only six weeks before the murder, in October or November of 2009. In April 2010, after the murder, the couple was arrested in Chicago after passing a wet bill to a Hyatt Regency doorman. Under arrest, the couple was found with $54,000 in counterfeit money, the date rape drug GHB, several handguns, and fake IDs. One of the handguns, a loaded Glock, was used to shoot Jamie Carroll. One of the big decisions when trying two people for the same crime is, do you try them together, or if you're trying them separately, who do you try first? Jeffrey Munt was a professional person with no criminal record. Banus was a convicted felon. So the state decided that if they could make a deal with both defendants to testify against one another, they would try Banus first. On February 26, 2013, the trial of Joey Banus began. The prosecution told the jury that both defendants were guilty. They drove this point home by telling the jury in detail the actions the two took to conceal Carol's body. 
Venus and Munt take the remaining meth and whatever money they can find on Mr. Carroll, and they carry out the rest of their plan. First, they clean up the blood, and there's a lot of it. Next, they go to a hardware store and buy a 50-gallon Rubbermaid container and some rubber foam. Now, when they get back, rigor mortis is starting to set in on Jamie Carroll, so they can't just put him in the container. They have to take a sledgehammer. They have to break his knees to wedge him inside. The prosecuting attorney continued. Next, they take the lime and they pour it all over Jamie's body. Then they take the foam sealant and seal it. And finally, they take duct tape and they wrap it around the container, all to conceal the smell of Jamie's corpse. They take hours digging a hole five feet deep and five feet wide, and they take the container and they stick it in the hole, and they fill it up with dirt, and they walk away. When it was their turn, Banus's defense told the jury the reason for the murder was that Munt was a spurned lover who killed Jamie Carroll and blamed the murder on their client. Banus's defense accused the police of focusing solely on Banus. On the stand, the lead detective told the jury he believed Jeffrey Munt was telling the truth. The detective explained that Munt seemed genuinely surprised at the news of the murder. He was emotional and was cooperative throughout. Jeffrey Munt took the stand wearing a suit and a gray tie. He told the jury that Banus had arranged to meet up with Mr. Carroll. He described Jamie Carroll as someone with whom someone has sex but no emotional relationship. In his confession, Munt had told the police he didn't know who Jamie Carroll was other than some drug dealer that Joey knew. Questioned about his own drug use, Munt explained, Meth makes me intensely focused and very sexual. Munt told the jury that they were using sex toys and playing around. Munt says he and Carol were on the bed and noticed Banus approaching the bed. Munt said he was thrown off of Jamie Carroll by Banus and thrown into a table at the bedside where he hit his head. Munt said at first he thought that Banus shoved him as part of some role play that he and Banus got into sometimes. Munt said he hit his head pretty hard and had a hard time getting up. Then he saw the other two struggling. He said he heard Jamie Carroll scream, No, Joey, please, no. Munt said Joey had a knife and he was slicing at Jamie's throat, telling the jury you could actually smell the blood. Munt went on to say, Remember, we were all naked. Munt said Joey shot Jamie, then pointed the gun at him and told him to lie on the bed. Munt said Joey gave him a choice, either help or be killed. Joey then gave Munt GHB to calm him down, and then the two dragged Jamie Carroll's body to the basement. The prosecution mapped out for the jury the various opportunities Munt had to raise the alarm about the murder, but did nothing. When asked about the fact that he did nothing, Munt responded, I did nothing. I did nothing. Out of fear. You're quite right and I have to live with that regret every day. Munt said he was terrified of Joey because he had threatened to kill his family and his pets. He said Joey made him go to work to avoid arousing suspicion, but Banus followed him to work, where he parked outside of his workplace to keep an eye on Munt throughout the day. Banus's defense team focused on Munt's lack of truthfulness due to the number of lies he'd told. Banus's lawyer questioned whether Munt had been attacked by Banus due to lack of physical injuries and his later admission that there was no knife involved, as he had told the 911 operator. Banus's lawyer asked Munt, even though he had ample opportunity to tell the truth, he chose not to. As if to underline the point, the attorney said to Munt, they treated you with kid gloves. They treated you like the victim. Munt seemed to gather his thoughts and then said, Well, first, I cannot agree with your supposition that I was considered a victim. The lawyer, in a tone of disbelief, said, You don't think you were treated like a victim when you got in there? Munt responded, Unlike Mr. Banus, I don't have a long history of interrogations to fall back on. Banus's lawyer, either seeing blood in the water or out of a genuine sense of anger, replied, What? Wait. Wait, what did you just say?
What did you just say to this jury? Did I ask you a question about that? Did I ask you anything about Mr. Banus's history? No, no, sir, I'm sorry, said Mund. The attorney went on. Are you saying whatever you want to say to infuriate this jury and trying to get the evidence in front of this jury about Mr. Banus in an inappropriate way? Is that what you're attempting to do? Again, Munt apologized. I'm sorry. I thought it was relevant. I apologize. Banus's defense lawyer, Mr. Wolf, said, you will agree with me that nowhere until you actually walked up to the edge and saw the polygraph guy did you make this claim that you were afraid of Mr. Banus and had been tortured by him. Banus's attorney then read a text Munt sent to Banus after the murder that was loving and affectionate. Then it was pointed out that after their arrest in Chicago, Munt had put up $20,000 to bail Banus out of jail. This seemingly effective cross-examination, impeaching the testimony of the star witness, would soon take a detour. Banus's defense used Munt's online profile as a way of breaking through his professional facade, creating the impression for the jury that Munt was a freak. The homosexual freak part was heavily implied. Munt's dating profile said he was into S&M, but it was the details of his BDSM involvement that seemed to transfix the Banus defense team. Listing all of Munt's kinks, breath play, latex, restraints, and paddling, it went on and on and on. At one point, Munt was asked to explain what P and P meant in his profile. Munt told the jury that refers to drug use, particularly methamphetamines. Party and play is P and P. Munt answered every question calmly, even the ones clearly meant to humiliate him. Banus's defense finished by questioning Munt's ability to tell the truth at all. In the state's closing argument, they reminded the jury of their duty to judge the guilt of Joey Banus, not to be distracted by sensationalism. The jury returned after 24 hours of deliberating and a night of being sequestered. At 10 a.m. the next morning, the jury filed in with a verdict. They found Joey Banus guilty on eight of the ten counts. Murder in the first degree, robbery in the first degree, tampering with physical evidence, three counts of possession of a forged instrument, the counterfeit money, possession of drug paraphernalia, and possession of an illegal substance. Then it was Jeffrey Munt's turn, and it would be a wild ride. In his book about the murder and trial, A Dark Room in Glitterball City, David Domine points out the care Munt's defense took in seating a jury, asking questions about their views of gay people, their religious leanings, and even asking questions to gauge their political conservatism. The prosecution opened by telling the jury that Banus and Munt killed Carol together and continued to live together. Munt's defense told the jury he was innocent and he didn't even do meth until he met Banus, a statement Munt on the stand would have to acknowledge was a lie. Munt's defense highlighted how short a time the two had known one another, dispelling the idea that they were some sort of star-crossed murderous couple. His defense told the jury that Banus and Carol had a drug deal and that Carol had backed out of that deal, leading Banus to kill him for his money and his drugs. The witnesses for Munt ranged from his former co-workers, who testified to his friendliness and professionalism. Many of the witnesses testified to how terrible and violent Banus was, including a prisoner who told the jury a fairly harrowing story of how Banus had orchestrated the rape of Munt behind bars. When it was Joey Banus's turn to take the stand, both sides worried about how he would do. Munt's defense called him a wild card. The prosecution said Banus was an exhausting personality to deal with. Like Munt, Banus had made a deal with the state in exchange for taking the death penalty off the table that he would testify against Munt. But when it became time to do so, his lawyers told the court that Banus would not be testifying against Munt. After striking a deal with the state, Banus had filed a motion seeking to set aside that agreement. He argued that he had entered into the agreement involuntarily and as a result of undue influence and prosecutorial misconduct. The court held a hearing on the motion, and it was subsequently denied. The prosecution once again offered Banus the same deal as before, and this time he took it, and it stuck. 
As the state was working out the deal with Banus again behind the scenes, in the courtroom, the prosecution played parts of a two-hour tape the couple made after the murder. In both of the tapes, you hear both Munt and Banus talking about their troubled relationship. At one point, Banus says that he is going to kill himself because he has done something that you can never recover from, which is he, that he took another person's life. He doesn't name the victim of that crime. In another video, Munt sitting on the bed, Banus is facing the camera with a gun in his hand, and he says that he's holding Munt hostage. The defense used this admission by Banus as proof that Munt was not guilty. In response, the prosecution told the jury that the defense hadn't played the entire tape, which included a section at the start where Banus and Munt seemed to be rehearsing Banus's statements. Just as the prosecution was wrapping up, came word that Joey Banus would testify. At 11.02 on May 4th, Banus took the stand. Banus told the same story he had in his confession, of blood flying and a struggle between Carol and Munt. Banus said, Munt produced a gun and shot Carol. After shooting him, he cut Carol's throat. Banus says he was forced to help bury Carol. After the murder, the couple stayed together for another six months. Banus testified that there were incidents of domestic violence that went both ways. He told the court about a time when he was smashed over the head with a bottle while he was sleeping. He says he assaulted Munt in retaliation. In Banus's best moment on the stand, he replied to Munt's defense attorney's assertion that he had framed Munt for the murder by saying, how do you frame someone for a murder when you bury a body in the basement of your own home and then for six months you engage in a relationship with the framer? As part of his closing argument to the jury, Munt's attorney said, homosexuals are the last group that it's okay to be prejudiced towards in our society today. I was amazed at the number of people in the jury questionnaire who said, I don't like gays. Then he added, I am 46 years old, and Jeff Munt is the first gay male I have ever hung out with. I'm ashamed it's under these circumstances. It has been my greatest privilege to defend Jeff Munt because he is innocent. After 11 days of trial, the jury got the case, and after barely eight hours of deliberation, they had a verdict. Jeffrey Munt was found not guilty of murder. He was convicted of robbery and tampering with evidence. Munt was sentenced to five years for tampering with evidence and three years for robbery to be served consecutively. Having spent three years in prison leading up to the trial, one year after the trial, Munt walked out of prison. He served four years of his eight-year sentence. He was sent to a halfway house, and then he was rearrested for a parole violation, but then he was finally released. On the one hand, with Joy Bannis's background, it's not too surprising he was found guilty of the murder. But what I find more interesting is the not guilty outcome for Jeffrey Munt. Despite all of the negative character assassination involving Munt's sex life and kinks, they didn't seem to work. His professional propriety, his composure, his ability to portray himself as a victim, not to mention the things that his defense learned from Banus's trial, all went to his acquittal on murder charges. This outcome is extremely rare in cases where couples are involved in murders, let alone gay couples involved in a murder. I'm left with a ton of questions about this case, but the one thing I know for sure is that Jamie Carroll was talented and brimming with promise and not given nearly enough time to see those things come to fruition. As the prosecutor reminded the jury, this was not just some murder victim. He was a human being with a family who loved him. He was adored and is missed to this very day. And for me, that heartbreaking fact alone makes him worthy of our love and compassion. If you or someone you know is struggling with substance abuse, please use the link below to find help in your area. If you or anyone you know is the victim of domestic violence, please share or use the link below. Help is available to you, and you deserve to live a life free of violence of any kind. If you're interested in these sorts of queer true crime stories, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Thank you for joining me. See you next time.